Good afternoon and happy St. Patrick's Day and welcome to Tesserarian Tales. Welcome to our new story starting today with the episode One Night with the King. My name is Richard. I am your keeper. Um, since it's a new story, if I could have our players, uh, starting with Keith and running from uh, right to left, introduce yourselves one more time. Hello, I am Keith. Uh, I am playing the character of Shaw Hughes in our story. Need I say more? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Jen. I'm playing uh, Maggie McGill. And I'm Beth, and I'm playing Anne Bailey. All right. So, when last we left our heroes, they had just finished a very successful auction that netted them a great deal of profit. Um, it was also a, a little hard on their psyches at times. Uh, as they found themselves caught in a cult war between several different factions, might have seen uh, the, uh, the presence of, a, of an elder god. Maybe not. We're in denial. But the good news is you had all summer off to rest, relax, recover, uh, occasionally answer questions about where to find books on cheeses from East Anglia. But you also earned the patronage of a playwright by the name of Ben Travers. Ben came into the shop several times a week for a while, and then at least once a week through the rest of the summer, looking for various texts about uh, the his about the hit ancient Greek history, mythology, a uh, couple of books on the occult, all sorts of things. Now you know Ben as a writer of comedies, fairly light fare, and he has said that he's determined to try and do something more serious, and. Thus, just about a month ago, he brought you a playbill for his new play called Carcosa, or Casilda and the King, or Casilda and the Stranger. My, my apologies. And so, he also brought you uh, a set of complimentary tickets for the opening night on October 17th at the New Scala Theater. Those of you with art history, which I'm pretty sure is Jen, um, it, you uh, you know that the Scala has had some ups and downs. It's closed, it's reopened, it's closed, it's reopened again, and presently um, makes its living by hosting both live events and, and movies on the weekends. And so, on the night of October the 17th, still waiting for the professor who, uh, who said he left on a business trip uh, but has not yet seem to have returned to London. Uh, so it absent him, sadly, the three of you are attending the new Scala Theater. If you could give me a brief description of how you gussy yourself up for the evening. Well, uh, with the um, newly acquired cash, um, well, I guess at this point, no longer newly acquired, but um, Shaw has gone and bought himself his second suit. Uh, so he will be wearing that. Um, um, hair combed back like he usually does when he's attempting to be presentable. It's not a big change, but it's a subtle one to people that know him. Um, Anne is dressed fashionably, fashionably for someone from the previous generation. Um, she wears no makeup, um, but she has made an extra effort to get her hair under control and a little less frizzy. Well, Maggie looks fabulous. Uh, Maggie has been to the beauty shop uh, she had her makeup is on point. Uh, she has on a, um, a a yellow dress with um, little blue flowers on it, um, and uh, has on a nice little black jacket over it. The new Scala Theater, as you enter, 
uh, has walls of dark red. A couple of posters are up, uh, some for this show, some for what's called a gang show, which you know to be a show that, actually a show that the, the uh, Boys and Girl Scouts and Scouts and Guides put on as sort of a review in order to be a fundraiser in the days prior to Girl Scout cookies. The theater itself is painted to appear to be uh, elegant white, has faded somewhat to off-white. Uh, you, uh, you all are sitting in the fourth row uh, with a good view of the stage. You can see that the theater is maybe about two-thirds full, and the balcony seats are not occupied tonight. When the curtain rises, the set, the staging is, well, quite frankly, it's odd. You have uh, towers from a variety of different uh, architectures and periods, starscapes that seem to sort of wink in and out at times. And the costumes seem to be a panoply. Like they threw open the costume closet and they were just grabbing whatever they could with nobles occasionally wearing Greek style, if not Roman togas, while well, guards are in uniforms, and people, but people are carrying firearms. And amidst this juxtaposition starts Act One, Scene One, which establishes the main characters, Casilda, the queen of Yatil, uh, and her squabbling children, Uot, uh, Camilla, and uh, Thale. All of them arguing over who will succeed the queen as master of Yatil. And so what we're going to do now is present a little bit of that play. In this case, where we're picking up is having established sort of the basics of who everyone is, a gong sounds off stage, and someone approaches the city. And this, this is strange within the context of the play because the roads are supposed to be awful, no one's visited Yatil in forever. And whoever this is, they showed up with no warning and no notice from the guards whatsoever. And so we pick up with uh, Beth playing the part of Casilda, uh, Jen playing the part of Camilla, and Keith playing the part of the stranger, and I'll be playing the incidental characters therein, mostly guards. And thus we start with one of the guards startled that the stranger has arrived, and the Queen Casilda comes in to demand to know what is going on. What is the meaning of this torch-lit parade into the gardens of my palace? Your Majesty! Explain, God, and to my satisfaction, how fifth torches could have formed a parade to the palace and not be stopped. Why was no alarm raised? If I hadn't seen them from my window, I would still not know they were here. Well, answer, or does your tongue function only slightly less well than your eyes? But, but your, your Majesty. Yes? Well, I, I, I didn't see them. You didn't see them? You didn't See them. You didn't see them. God, take this man to the infirmary and ask the surgeons to determine whether he suffers from exhaustion or blindness. Yes, my queen. Now, who are you? Truth am I. From the city of a great king to a no home come I. Look at him. Listen to him. The pallid mask, is it? Be warned by my brotherhood, must it? So you are an ambassador? Truth am I. From the city of a great king to a new home come I. Tis passing strange that we weren't expecting you. But you know how bad the roads are now, Mother. Maybe the message didn't arrive. Many messages has sent my king. We must apologize that there were none to meet you at the gates. Misunderstand the messages, perhaps, did ye? This distinguished member of our royal guard will escort you and your party to suitable rooms. You will be presented at court 
during the festival tomorrow, and I shall receive you there. Objections none have we. Rest need we. Take the ambassador and his party to the summer wing. I don't care who you have to wake up, but make sure that our guests here are comfortable. Yes, my queen. Oh, mother, I've just had the most marvelous idea. Have you? <laughs> yes, let's turn the dance tomorrow into a costume ball. We could have everyone wear those pallid masks and nobody would know who anybody was. Wouldn't that be just delicious? And I thought that you were the rational one in the family. Please, mother. Camilla, it is nearly morning. I'm sure this won't seem like such a good idea after a few hours of sleep. Please, mother. It'll be so much fun not knowing who's who, don't you think? Camilla. Please. Oh, very well. But you'll have to arrange it. Oh, I will. In the morning. Oh, thank you, mother. Thank you. Good night. Now, uh, what was it you came in to tell me before all this excitement started? Oh, I don't remember. I'm sure it was nothing. Good night then, Camilla. Can you stand a better watch than your comrade did? Of course, my queen, for I can see we're blind, was my friend Corporal Bick. Oh, good. Then you can take the rest of his watch. Why, I even dread Carcosa's sea on the far banks of the Lake of Ali. What? What did you say? Carcosa throws her towers to the sky above the Lake of Ali, and the moons set silently before them in the night. Look! I do see it. I do. What does this mean that others see it as well? Can it still be a delusion? It's no delusion if two share it, your majesty. It's real. Then all is lost. But wait, I, I haven't found the yellow sign. Perhaps there's time yet to save us? The yellow sign must not be found. I must speak to my son Thale and see what he learns from the priest. Indeed. Perhaps he can at last be of some use. Everyone should be useful, don't you think? Yes, perhaps Thale will know something. Between now, Talba and Aldones, I am in a vice. Good night, fair queen, and good day to night, for here rise the twin suns. And there is where scene one ends, strangely. Things moving along almost listlessly as the curtains close, and the set is adjusted for a party of some sort. And as it opens on the scene two, I need everyone to grab their envelopes. And now you may go ahead and open them. For those of you in the viewing audience, each cast member received an, audio, uh, received, uh, an envelope this week. And what they're reading right now that they didn't know they were reading until right now is what their character sees during Act 1, Scene 2. And then if I could get each of you to give me just a brief description of your character's reaction to what they see as the scene unfolds. Shaw's brow, uh, already somewhat furrowed at the the strangeness uh, of the first act, um, furrows more. Uh, he grows increasingly tense, uh, and at one point jumps and looks behind him before turning back to the stage. Um, Anne? 
unless people are, are paying attention to her, it may not be obvious how she's... Um, but she's definitely getting tense and disquieted. Um, she's frowning, but almost at first in, in something more like anger than confusion. Um, and then finally she's gripping the armrests on her seat. So Maggie, up until this point, seems to have been really engaged, really, really interested, like like trying to to unravel a puzzle. Um, she a, a, lo a lot of the the things that seem anachronistic, she she's she's nodding and, and being like, okay, I I, I I get what that is. Um, at a certain point, um, she kind of frowns, and it's it's sort of like um, it's it's sort of like when when she's trying to to figure out something weirdly complex, like like how to how to pickpocket someone or something like that, where she's she's she's. But but in this case, she's she's not making any attempt to hide the fact that she's she's trying to work something out. Um, at one point, um, there's a, a couple of people, uh, a few rows, few rows in front of us. That would be the front row. Um, but uh, a, a little bit in front of us that uh, get whispering and and get up to leave, and. Maggie almost says something and and just kind of looks at, at the rest of you like, can you believe these people? Oh. And then she gets back engaged with the play. And as the three of you are working through uh, your feelings from your reactions to the production, the stranger in his tattered robes slid to the forward center of the stage. He throws his arms out. And what he does, his robes part, and you can see smeared on his chest in this strange ochre paint is what you, Anne, recognize as the symbol from the, uh, the construction below your shop. The question mark, that, or a mixture of a question mark and a Triskelion. Uh, but here, your anthropological training tells you the one underneath your shop had worn away to the point that it was disquieting, but... It was really just a sketch. This this means something, and your your brain tries to wrap around what it means, and you you can't quite piece it together. The other two of you are frankly horrified, and you're not even sure why. It's, it's it should just be paint on someone's chest, but something about this is really disquieting. And you, Maggie, your uh, your dabblings in occult texts in order to answer certain questions tell you that everything up to this point seems to have been building almost like a ritual. And as the curtain falls, the, the image of the yellow sign blazed into your heads right before intermission. I need each of you to make a stability test. Six. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Bailey, is that a one? Your your figure's slightly out of camera. Two, two, two. Okay. So the good news is, uh, you don't you you don't lose stability yet. <laughs> <laughs> the bad news uh, is, there's another act in the play. Um, <laughs> however. During intermission, um, as you're walking, as you're walking out of the theater, both uh, Miss Bailey and Mr. Hughes feel almost energized by that moment. That this this play is exciting now, e even in its strangeness. It's it's so weird. You want to see more. 
uh, whether that's because you're intrigued by where it's going or whether or not it's like watching Death Race 2000 and you just got to see to the end. Um, <laughs> it, it has captivated your imagination. And the three of you are standing uh, in, the, uh, in the foyer uh, appreciating intermission and are now free to talk amongst yourselves for a few minutes. You have 15 minutes before they blink the lights and send you back in. This is somewhat unexpected. It's weird. Is this is this normally what theater's like? <laughs> Not generally, no. Oh. It felt a bit weird. It, more than a bit, yes. Hmm. How much do we know about this um this Travis? Kind of, yeah, him. Well, seem, it seems nice. Um, he's not uh, not snobby. He's he's just a regular, regular bloke. Hmm. I rather liked him. Did that symbol look at all familiar to either of you? No, but it was so weird. I didn't like it. I I don't know. I don't understand why but it just it just was wrong in some way did it look familiar to you we drew it for you when it's in the basement the basement of our shop what other basement would i be talking about do you know why no all i know is it looked See, now, I thought at first, at first that it looked like a church, but maybe now, maybe it was a theatre. But that doesn't make any sense. Cause he in the basement. It. In the basement. Well, it used to be theatre buildings, but he just wrote this. Maybe he got it from somewhere else. Well, he's, been, he's definitely been doing lots of research, but not nothing like this. Well, you know how these arts people are. They borrow things. Yes, and that's perfectly legitimate theatrical tradition. <laughs> <laughs> oh, certainly. It's perfectly legitimate to have no originality at all. <laughs> Because Shakespeare, of course, had no originality whatsoever, or George Bernard Shaw, or anyone. I mean, come on, Anne. You can't be that ignorant. What did you just call me? I apologize. But it is a long-established theatrical tradition. And you must know that. Are these your people, then? These artists? I mean, I, I studied at university drama, as, as literature, that is, not, not, as, not in performance, but I do, I, I mean, I do. I like going to the theatre. Well, I see that I've touched a nerve. I don't think, however, that that's the important point right now. We've gotten off a bit. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I can see how some of it was, I mean, it was, it was daring, it was avant-garde, but... It was what? It's a French thing, don't, don't, don't worry. Um, it felt like a ritual. And on that not at all ominous note, a nice <laughs> blink. And you make your way back to your seats. The second act uh, <laughs> unfolds for you uh, in the same way for each of you, luckily. Um, the first scene is a severe looking room that has been taken over uh, by the stranger as the various members of Casilda's family try to wheedle for his favor. Thale talks about uh, 
talks about the priestly caste and the importance of the coming of the king in yellow. Whereas Uot tries to bargain uh, politically with the stranger. Casilda even goes so far as to propo pro uh, propose an alliance, even though it's quite clear from, the, uh, from her manner that she doesn't care for the stranger. And through it all, two things happen that are a little strange, maybe experimental theater. One, a, a child, maybe six or seven years old, wanders on the stage, apropos of nothing, and just seems to watch the stranger for about half the scene. And the thing that you don't really even notice until the scene is almost over is that there have been all these exchanges, and the stranger throughout the entire scene said nothing. Maggie looks in the playbill to see if the kid is credited. Uh, the kid, the child is not. Hmm. The final scene of the play is at a big party. It is at the party, in fact, that Camilla proposed. And everybody's in masks. There's even a small house orchestra playing. Uh, lots of costumes. A little bit of pyrotechnics setting off some smoke in the background. And a couple of things you notice as the, uh, the production unfolds, especially uh, Anne and Shaw, is while the party is going on, all those little twinkling stars in the background, they start going out one by one, vanishing from the background. And then the towers, all the different archaic and anachronistic architecture starts to the light seems to pass down it to give it a sense almost as though it's, it's melting away. The actors themselves seem to grow almost listless, almost like they're reciting their, their dialogue by rote until the stranger stands before everyone and the queen says it is time to unmask and he reveals he wears no mask. And the moment the stranger reveals this, part of the set actually falls over and crumbles to the ground. And there's a billow of smoke, maybe from a fog machine or something. And this thing that looks a bit like the stranger, but larger, maybe seven and a half feet tall, clearly some sort of uh, mock-up for someone to wear. This is the king in yellow, in tattered ochre robes. And he slides out onto the stage, followed by the child. The king never says anything to anyone, but it becomes clear that he is the destruction of everything around, and that Yatil, as a city, has somehow become distant Carcosa. It's somewhat confusing, and the thing seems to almost... It's not even as though the play ends so much as everyone just sort of stops, sort of gives up. And the curtain falls as everyone stares at one another, almost in confusion. And it is at this point that Miss Bailey and Mr. Hughes lose three stability and one sanity. And seven people start to riot, attacking the people in the, in the seats next to them. Violence breaks out throughout the theater, and there are shrieks, there are screams, Anne, what are you doing? Uh, fleeing. I didn't bring my gun to the theater. Okay. Maggie? Yeah, um, making making sure that Anne and, and, and Shaw get out. Okay. Shaw? Yeah, hoofing it. Okay. <laughs> hoofing it. <laughs> so the three of you break, along with the rest of the theater, racing towards the doors. Um, as you come out the doors and you see people pouring out ahead of you, because you were fairly for, far forward in the theater, the other thing you see is that people who have gotten outside have also started to attack one another in the street and have been doing so for about a minute now, just long enough for the police to arrive. At the same time, strangely, off to the side, Maggie, you especially, because, uh, and you can see that your, your friends are clearly very upset by what they've seen, though they haven't, they haven't quite lost control of themselves. But you can see that two ushers are inviting people 
into a bar connected to the theater for what was a proposed after party. Most people are presently ignoring this. However, those who are running outside do appear to be getting arrested. What would you like to do? Are you two all right? It's, uh, no. I don't know. I don't know. Perfectly fine. Just do you want to sit down and have a drink or not? Uh, doesn't seem like it's a good idea to try to push through that. It's a bit of a mess out here. <laughs> Maybe take the edge off. I'd be all right with that. Maggie kind of like looks inside. Are, are the are the people in the the bar um, more chilled out than the people outside? Right, right now it looks like it's mostly the bartenders and the waitstaff who you presume did not watch the play. Okay. Uh, so yes. So can everyone please give me uh, either an athletics or a fleeing check? Six. Jeez. <laughs> Four. Playing. Athletics. One. Mr. Hughes is buffeted by a few people as he tries to navigate around, but he takes uh, two points of health damage. <laughs> as he's knocked around, oof, 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 but manages to get out. There's an oddly surreal feeling because you move into the bar and the bar seems calm, even as you can hear a half riot going on behind you in the foyer of the theater. The barman is uh, sort of trying to peer over to the bar through the, uh, the doorway. Gin and tonic, please. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. What, what's going on over there? Uh, new play. Political, political play. It sparked a, a riot. Uh, politics. Do it every time. What can I get you? Whiskey. Neat. Oh, I'll have the same. <clears throat> Drinks are passed out. You begin sipping. <laughs> Not, not, not sipping. <laughs> <laughs> and after about 10 minutes, uh, the actors start to trickle in because it's the after party. Uh, a few other audience members also discover that this is a, a way not to get caught up in the, the, the police action happening outside. I was going to say, it, how, it, is it still a mess outside? Um, when you peer outside, yeah, because you have maybe about 100 people outside, and it appears the police are trying to guide them all into uh, into orderly queues in order to figure out what happened. Um, but none of them are coming into the bar because they're not creating – the bar isn't creating a disturbance. Yet. We're, just, we're quietly going insane in here. Thank you very much. <laughs> But you're there uh, in the reception, and the actors who played uh, in the show are starting to come in, uh, each one to a, a small smattering of applause. But <laughs> Shaw will clap hesitantly. <laughs> Maggie just hunkers down. <laughs> Until eventually, after all the cast is to, uh, has arrived, uh, Mr. Travers himself walks in, looking like, for all the world, like the conquering hero. He seems pleased as punch with the uh, the effort he has achieved tonight. And there's a there's a spatter a bit more smattering of laws, and he waves everyone down. And goes, well, <sighs> as we know, any work of art should seek to inspire fervor, and it's clear we have done that tonight. So I. I would count this as a as a bit extreme, but a success nonetheless. So congratulations to one and all. Thank you. Thank you. 
That's all he says, and he goes to get a drink from the bar. And so, you have a couple of choices here. You can sit quietly and drink, and and not interact with anyone other than to stare at one another and go, what have we gotten ourselves into? Um, also, however, there are uh, the cast is here, uh, as is Mr. Travers, uh, any of which may be engaged in polite and delightful conversation. I'm looking for Mr. Michael Gillen. Mr. Gillen, playing the part of the stranger. Uh, you pick him out. Uh, you ask you ask a couple of people, and you uh, you are appointed to uh, a man who is an older gentleman, but appears well preserved for his age. Uh, gray hair uh, outside of the mask. It's the big open face. Um, as he moves around the room, you can see he moves a little stiffly, like he's maybe pulling a leg. Um, like you, he uh, he is dressed smartly, if uh, about a generation out of date. Um, and he is presently uh, enjoying a cup of coffee. A good evening to you. Oh, and to you as well. Do you mind if I sit? Not at all, please. What are you drinking? Can I buy? Oh, uh, coffee, but it's an open bar for the for the reception. Well, well, done. well done. It was very interesting, today. Eh? It was. Ben is an old friend, and so I, I didn't want to tell him no. It's, it's rather strange, though, don't you think? Well, it's all the rage these days, isn't it, with the young people? They sort of, what words did she use? Avant-garde. Oh, yes, yes, avant-garde. Ben has used that word many a time in, in the last few months, yes. So, I'm interested on in your take. Having uh, spent more time with these lines than I have, I just, I just heard them this evening. As interesting as it was, I'm not sure I understand. Oh, I'm not sure I do either. Um, ben says he got it from a French play, um, and it, this is vague recollection of that play. He read it several years ago, but it, he said it made a strong impression, and therefore he went looking for different related materials in order to try and build a theatrical experience. Anne's face is all over, I told you so, and she's not even with... <laughs> <laughs> Is that so? Well, what did you make of it? Well, I uh, I represent Doubleday Doran and Company uh, to their offices in Garden City, New York, and we are responsible for produ uh, for publishing Ben's plays in the United States. I don't know if we'll publish this one. Um, his producers had a bit of a tiff with him in back. Uh, Declaring that they're not certain that they will see the play make its complete run yet. Um, they, apparently, they don't approve of uh, rioting the streets. <laughs> hmm. Well, can't say that I do either. What do you make of your part in it, though? What, what does the stranger represent? Hmm. Well. Literarily speaking, I might say, he represents he represents the other, the unknown, um, those things that we we fail to comprehend and are therefore distracted from in our in our myriad petty little jealousies, uh, Casilda and her children wrapped up in their personal dramas, even as the stranger is essentially proclaiming to them that their lives are over. Hmm. I can absolutely see that. I appreciate you chatting with me. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, Miss... Bailey. Oh, yes. Ben has talked about you extensively. I shall have to... I shall have to pop in. Um, I, uh... I did my PhD in ancient languages from Oxford. And, uh, so I'm interested in, uh, what sort of text you might have on perhaps something in cuneiform. Oh, of course, too. 
And if you, you be around for a week or so, maybe the professor will be back. I'm sure he'd love to speak to you. Oh, most excellent. I always enjoy communing with a fellow academic. Good evening to you then and well done. Oh, thank you very much. And what about the rest of you? Is the kid there or um, did, uh, and, and did, did the kid or, okay, were there bows at the end? Uh, there were not. Okay. Uh, the curtain went down and the riot set off. Okay. So there was uh, no curtain call. Okay. Um, is the kid at the reception? No, it's an open bar. So no, they didn't bring the child. Um, I used to go to open bar opening night parties when I was nine, but you know, I guess I'm a bit more liberal. Um, in terms of the number of people that entered from like with the actors mm -hmm. and based on the limited amount that one would be able to tell about the, the figure of the king, does it look like whoever was playing the king might be here or just too hard to tell? Um, it's not, it's, it's impossible to tell just by sight. Okay. Uh, that costume was clearly like Big Bird. Uh, right. It just enveloped. <laughs> except completely not like Big Bird. Except it's for the yellow, yellow. other than yellow, you know. <laughs> now I so want a Sesame Street skit. A <laughs> Big Bird is the king of yellow. <laughs> Snuffleupagus is the stranger. Sorry. Sorry. We won't get into where Mr. Snuffleupagus fits into that. Yes. Well, so I'll sidle up to uh to Travers. Okay. With my need whiskey. He, he shakes your hand. Thank you so much for staying. How did you like it? I was, there was a lot to see. Yes. It I, is a bit busy in places, yes. I did, um, I did have a question. Uh, yes, of course. There was a, a little, a little kid. Um, oh, yes. Kind of like he was lost. Where, was that? You know, part part of the play, or oh yes, no, he's uh, he's the child of a uh, George and Hannah, the Keats. And what um, what what was that about? I'm sorry, I'm I'm not much of a. Oh, is... that. So, the child in this case represents the future, and that uh, he's coming in and just sort of. It's not even so much that he has purpose so much as he's just sort of following events in their wake. Okay. Okay. I I understand. Um the tra the child I admit is my own addition from uh, from what I from what I recall of the play I read that inspired this fire within my mind. Oh. So it's based on it's, this is your version of, of existing. Yes, yeah, so, yes, a uh, it's a French play. Yes. Do you happen to know the name of it? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I'm going to pronounce it horribly. I can't speak French. I can read it. It's Le Roi en Jean. It means the King in Yellow. Okay. All right. Well, um, congratulations to you. Uh, hopefully, the mess outside doesn't put. Uh, a damper on your celebrations. That would be ridiculous. No such thing as bad publicity. <laughs> right. Have a good evening. And you as well. <laughs> Miss McGill, are you going to, uh, do you wish to engage anyone in conversation or are you, uh, are you hanging back to just watch all this transpire? She's she's hanging back to watch stuff transpire. Um, 
not not possessing any any kind of psychoanalysis or anything, but do all of the actors seem like they're like stable? So, <laughs> I mean, uh, with, uh, with the understanding that she has met actors, and sure. and there's <laughs> there's a range. Absolutely. Uh, go ahead and roll an e six. Okay, I I'm, I'm re rolling that because that's the third six that I've rolled in a row, and that's just that's just not right. Satan. Okay. Oh my god, I got another six. So, um, the uh, the young lady who was playing Camilla okay. is, uh, is keeping to herself in the corner and is studying her drink. She appears to have some sort of cocktail. Uh, what, one of those in the, in the various shades of amber, so you can't necessarily tell what's in it. Uh, but she just seems to be just studying her cocktail very diligently uh, and not engaging anyone else in conversation. All right. Maggie will go over and say, oh, um, you're, you're one of the actresses, aren't you? Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. Yes. Um, um, my, my name's Jean. Jean. Hi, Jean. Jean Hewitt. Jean Hewitt. So pleased to meet you. My, my name's Maggie McGill. Um, that was that was quite an interesting piece, wasn't it? It it was. And Jean is uh, Jean is a pretty young woman. Uh, fashion's uh, a little off. But she's slightly pale, freckles on her face, uh, and somewhat unfashionably long red hair, um, which she has sort of kind of pinned back, but. Um, and, but she is making an effort to, to smile and engage with you uh, as you try to talk to her. You all right? Uh, well, one is always tired after, after a production. Oh, yes, yes. I know the, the rehearsal week is, is often um, quite draining. Indeed, yes. It's a very odd play, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Did it, it, it... There were parts that made me uncomfortable in a different way than daring art generally does. Does that make sense? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. And she she seems to sidle away from you as though you're poking something uncomfortable, um, and it occurs to you you may you may need to uh, enlist someone better at interpersonal interpersonal <laughs> than you uh, if you are uh, if you if you're gonna wheedle wheedle something there's clearly something that is bothering her right um, but you have been very friendly it's very suddenly and it, it you don't know why but she's that you can see the walls going up. Yeah. Well, um, it was a pleasure meeting you. Um, actually, there's a there's, there's someone that I'd, I'd love to um, introduce. I, I work at a bookstore, um, and uh, uh, a couple of my colleagues, uh, I think, might uh, might like to meet you. If, if if I might, may bring them over. That'd be fine. Yes. 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 Maggie goes over and is like, she knows something, but she, she knows there's something wrong about this, but I can't get her to talk. You want to talk to her, Sean? You're muted. Me? What am I going to say? I don't know. And? Uh, I, I can give it a try, I guess. Or Anne. Well, I suppose she might be interested in the young man before she'd be interested in me. <laughs> we can both go, of course. Um, I was going to go over and uh, introduce int Jean, Jean Hewitt, is that it? Yes, yes. Jean Hewitt. But why don't we go around and get an autograph? A splendid idea. 
Yeah. All right. The, so, three you, the three of you squat up and approach the uh, the rest of the. <laughs> yeah. We're not intimidating at all. Oh, God. <laughs> um. Jean, I, I wanted to uh, introduce you to uh, a couple of friends of mine. This is Anne and uh, and Shaw. Oh. Can I refresh mm -hmm. your drink? Certainly. Uh, what are you drinking? Um, scotch and soda. Certainly. I'll be right back. That Shaw Law, the name the name Hewitt rings out to you uh, because the Honorable Gordon Lord Hewitt is the uh, Lord Chief Justice of England, sitting on the King's Bench Division. President, oh. he's big judge. Well, um, possibly making reference to that, but also mostly using. Uh, the desire for an autograph as leverage, uh, perhaps I could spend a point of flattery. You could absolutely spend a point in flattery. Um, she, the moment you ask for an autograph, she seems to light up um, as though she's just pleased and punch, and you have validated her choice, even to her judge dad, to, uh, to pursue an acting career. And she becomes Fairly more effusive as uh, Maggie returns with her drink. Um, is there anything someone so, so, is there anything someone would like to ask specifically? I was just um, uh, speaking with uh, with Jean here about um, how the play was. Um, a bit, uh, well, it was definitely different. Definitely that, yes. Well, my understanding, I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. My understanding was that he got it from uh, the ideas, from a French play. And <laughs> I'm going to employ some art history here. Okay. You know... I don't. I honestly don't know that much about the play he got it from. No one's. Ever, none of us have ever seen it. He he says he doesn't own a copy. It's just based on his memories of it. I won't be sorry to see. It's terrible of me to say this, especially on opening night. But I won't be sorry to see this play behind me. It it seems to be following me home. Oh. Well, I mean, that's much as, especially you know, last week before the show starts, you're rehearsing every day. So it's, it's invaded my dreams. That thing, that giant yellow thing that comes on at the end, I can see it's, it's robes moving and that you know there's no wind. And these, they, and, oh, every time they mention that lake, I can, I can see it in my sleep. I, and that's the weird thing because we, obviously we don't have a lake on stage, <laughs> but I can see it, giant and glass-like with, well, things like that, that Loch Ness thing they talk about in, in, in Scotland, <laughs> scuttling about underneath it. It's, oh. It has made it difficult to get any rest. Well, Shaw says, like, looking at Anne and Maggie kind of askance, I'm sure, you know, pre-show jitters and that sort of thing, it, it should pass. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Seven. Seven. Balance your drink. Well, I'm not normally much for the theatre, but I must say I found your character to be one of the more intriguing ones. Well, thank you. Especially the way you played her at the end of the first act. Uh, what's that part where um, her mum was talking about each of the children? Oh. Um. 
Um, well, I know she, she addresses us all in turn to, to explain why we're, we're not suited, but I, I'm, I'm not sure I know which one, which part you're talking about. But the part where she's talking about the yellow sign. Yeah, <laughs> and at this point, Shaw's making the hello face. <laughs> so, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, both of you are like, the what? <laughs> that didn't, that didn't. Well, happen. I mean, so the yellow sign, they, they mentioned the yellow sign in several places in the play, and it's supposed to be something that they find that's supposed to save them, but no one ever really seems to know what it is. Um, and then there's that weird yellow paint job they put on uh, poor Michael. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, that. Why do you say poor Michael? Well, it, uh, it gave him a rash, poor dear. Oh my. That's just a bit more than I needed to know. No, but she does talk about it. She talks about it when she says that the family is held together by the yellow sign. I remember that part quite clearly. She, she looks perplexed. Um, at what part of the play did I doze off? Was that when those people were talking in front of us? The people were talking in front of us? Hmm. What people? Well, they, they, it was very rude. They, they, they were talking and then they got up and left in the middle of it. But when when was this? In the play? Like, you know, it goes in acts. Before the second act. Okay. It's right before, it was right before he opens the robe to reveal the paint. Okay, there, there was no... Nobody said anything in that scene. What? Of course they did. There didn't. were no lines in that scene. What sort of play would it be without lines? Well, it was... It would be a ballet. Weird, but... <laughs> the rest of it was weird, too. I mean... I did, they just... She... <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. What... If you'll excuse me a moment. Thank you. Oh, it was lovely meeting you, Jean. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> she sort of skitters away from the three people who are just now realizing they all seem to have sat next to one another and seen different things. Yeah, well, and, and Shaw kind of does that. Well, hold on, wait. Damn it. <laughs> and if I can get all of you to make a stability test, please. Yay. All right. Okay, dice. Okay, one. that was a one. There we go. I feel vindicated. It, come, it comes around. I stole the six. <laughs> then, uh, Maggie, Shaw, as the two of you <sighs> contemplate, but I saw, but you saw, but you are unsettled and lose <laughs> to stability. Something is brought on. How's the riot looking? Is it over? Uh, yes, the riot seems to be over. Um, peace has been restored outside. Can I get a gin and tonic in a to-go cup? <laughs> Give me a proper tip, you will. Sure. <laughs> Don't see the play. That's the tip. And then seems she does. And then she does the, give him a good tip. Seems to be the going wisdom tonight. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> and does anyone else want to do anything before they leave the after party? Um, is it possible? on our way out to peek back into the theater? Absolutely. Wait, 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 wait what are you doing? <laughs> I want to see if it's still there. If what is? 
Okay. Well, look. You said you saw one thing, and I saw something else. So, I want to take a look. The building's still there. Doesn't sound like a good idea. Well, what caused the building? We were all in the same building. It's what was going on on stage. That was well, the actors are all in there, aren't they? Well, they all looked the same to me. Right. What, what are you thinking you're going to see? I don't know. The the doors to the theater are still open. The uh, the house lights are up, um, though they don't work particularly well. So long shadows are cast, uh, and the balcony seats, which were unoccupied, uh, look like a, a black pit, sort of a black hole in the wall uh, at this angle, uh, so that there you have the grand proscenium stage with its somewhat faded. Maroon curtains, and then what looks like with the uh, with the balcony off to one side and the long shadows, just like something with like a large open mouth gaping at you as you peer through the door. Right. Other than that, it looks like, like an empty theater. So we've seen enough. Then should we go home? Yeah, yeah. Let's go home. <laughs> Fine. And we're pretty close to the theater. Well, the, the, the shop is pretty close to the theater district, right? Yep. Just a half mile. And so you make your way back out into the evening to your respective homes for a good night's sleep after a fashion. The next day. Actually, a good night's sleep. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, mean, I was waiting for the end. Yeah. Please roll. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, uh, you have a relatively normal day in the shop. So, Miss Bailey, what does that look like for for the proprietor of C.W. Bailey and Son? Well, now that we have Alfie, I spend a bit less time behind the counter, so I can turn my attention to making sure the books are in order and that by that I mean both the books on the shelves and the books of the star. The numbers that keep us afloat. So I do however keep an eye on Alfie, he'd be being new, but he took care of the place while I was gone for the summer so Pretty Alfie old. is a, a bright-eyed young man whose eyes always seem to be just like, super wide when he's talking. That's not disturbing at all. <laughs> yes, can I help you with something? Yes, yes, of course. Oh, we have that right over here. Follow me. And, of course, making myself available uh, for people because I, Alfie, I wouldn't have hired him if he didn't know something, but he doesn't know everything. So... I'm available for questions on rarer books and whatnot. Well, you do receive one question on where to find texts on uh, the use of heroin in London in the 19th century. I you also receive a letter Ooh. that appears to have been placed in the post this day and couriered over to you. It is an invitation to the management staff of C.W. Bailey and Sons to pay a call on Harcourt Williams, the director of the Old Vic Theater, because he has a commission for you. If you would pay a call on him at noon tomorrow, that would be lovely. Well, All right. And your, your credit rating skill, without even a spend, tells you that the Old Vic Theater is sponsored by a, uh, a royal companion. I will be more to that, then. Mrs. Lillian Bayliss is a companion of honor. And Mr. Williams is the theater director. 
Miss McGill, what does a uh, normal day for you look like? Uh, Maggie gets in later than she's supposed to every day. Um, and uh, uh, makes some coffee and um, sets about uh, her work in the back. Uh, generally, this, this consists of looking at any new books that have come in um, and making sure that they are tidied up and in their, their best possible shape. Um, she doesn't make them nicer than their best possible shape unless she checks with Anne first, usually. Um, just keeping, keeping, sort of keeping, um, when, when, when any new books are taken care of, uh, just going back and sort of checking the stacks and, uh, making sure that, 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 you know, if there's anything that's gotten dusty, that it gets cleaned properly. Um, yeah, okay. that kind of stuff. Mr. Hughes. Um, so, uh, Shaw's routine, uh, since the happenings of the first story, uh, has changed slightly. For one, uh, especially since the the uh, the acquisition of his his shiny new suit, which he's very very proud of, um, uh, he has been making more of a, an effort and more of a show of networking while he's in the store, but also around town. Um, the, the, the passing out not obviously not business cards but like that sort of thing like mm. he's making a big effort to calling cards to be sure okay so yeah um but making sure that they know uh where the store is what sort of things the store sells and more importantly where to find me when you should you need something um and also uh, he's been spending some more time uh, going over the stock of the store, making sure he knows exactly uh, what what volumes we have in what editions and in what condition, um, so that should he be called upon uh, away from the store to recite such information for, say, someone who was interested in buying, he could do so. Excellent. And so, Miss Bailey, uh knowing that Mr. Hughes has been reviewing and updating your catalog and that Miss McGill is apparently a complete theater otaku. Um, with whom are you going to share your invitation <laughs> to the old fake tomorrow? Well, I'll be sharing with both of them. Uh, uh, because if it's a commission we're after, then... Um, Shaw at least will need the information. And uh, Maggie might hear something useful should we find a, a, a less than perfect copy or whatever. <laughs> so that I, I'll, I'll be telling them both. Okay. Well, feel free to tell them both then. Well, fine then. That's not how you asked it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> she'll, um, gesture to Shaw to follow her back to Maggie's den. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear Alfie out front. Oh, a book on feet. Yes, we have that right over here. Why do we have a book on feet? Never mind. <laughs> it's uh, it's Victorian and, and it's <laughs> dirty. <laughs> <laughs> See, <laughs> and like asks that question out loud as they're walking through the door, and without skipping a beat, Maggie just answers it. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> ah, well, we have a meeting tomorrow, so I hope you haven't got anything important on your schedules. No. Oh. All right. Who with? Harcourt Williams at the old Vic. Says he's got a job for us. Oh, the theatre. Weird theme. Nice. Seems we're making some connections. So, mm -hmm. so. that'll be at noon. And I can drive us all over. Um, all right. Oh. So no problem. W would you rather... Um, nice. 
We can old, old Vic, not that far. Nice day out. Maybe we could walk, Sean. I would prefer to walk if that's all right with everyone else. I can meet you there if it's a problem. Uh, it's not a problem at all, but why it is, is, is it a problem? It's just a nice day, don't you think? Haven't we had nice weather lately? Fine. Much obliged. And uh, Maggie, uh, art and uh, actually just your your art skill with no spend at all uh, tells you a little bit a little bit about the theater politics currently surrounding the old Vic. Mm. Uh, Arkart Williams has had a string of less than successful productions mm. and, and has recently lost. Uh, Mr. John Gilgood has left behind the theater in order to pursue a film career. Yes, and so there has begun to be some discussion about whether or not Mr. Williams is suitable to remain in his position as director. Interesting. And with that on the books, I think we're going to go ahead and take our break. Uh, it's five minutes early, but that's okay. Um, so we're going to take our 10-minute break now, and we'll come back in 10 minutes and pick up with a, a meeting at a, another theater. I'm sure this will go much better. All right. I will see everyone in 10 minutes.
And we're back. All right. So the next day uh, is a typical day in London, overcast and a little cold. Um, lovely day for a walk. Lovely day for a walk. <laughs> and you stroll your way over to the old Vic Theater. And it has a has a strange, a peculiar effect on you in that you were just over at the uh, at the new Scala, but going into the the old Vic, you now see, oh, this is what a theater that's kept up to date is supposed to look like. The velvet is clean. Um, there are people out working and keeping uh, keeping all the nooks and crannies of the theater clean throughout all hours of the day. And when you arrive, uh, there is someone waiting for you in the foyer, uh, looking around. He sees the three of you and goes, Ah, you are here to see Mr. Williams, yes? Please follow me. Um, and leads you up above the theater. You catch a couple of glimpses into the many seats uh, in the and the stage is currently open. There are a couple of people there reading their lines and appear to be shouting at each other about something regarding family, as one does in theater. And you are led to an office that appears there might be walls somewhere behind the stacks of books, plays, notes that seem to form an, an additional perimeter uh, around the desk of a somewhat harried man staring down at the desk, looks up. Oh, very good. Please, please come in. Harcourt Williams, pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you all. Please, have a seat. Uh, tea? That'd be lovely. Thank you. Certainly. Yes. Well, good. Excellent. Uh, tea for you. Tea for you. Uh, sugar, anyone? Tea is passed out. He sits down. He sort of stares at his cup for a moment. Takes a deep breath. So he's... I understand that the uh, three of you were at the production of uh, Ben Travers's play last night. Is that correct? That we were. How did you like it? <coughs> <laughs> it was odd. That's what I've heard. And of course, the the, uh, the police incident did manage to make the papers this morning. However. I can imagine. A little bird told me that he based it on another play. Oh, uh, yeah, The King in Yellow. Yes. So, Travis has made a big deal out of how he can do this serious play away from his, his Follies works. And I'm interested in trying to produce something that catalyzes a more, a more serious reaction from the audience. So... I'm interested if you if you think it is within your means, uh, in employing you to acquire me a copy of the original play. Well, well we can find it certainly, but but I, I think it well. would take a lot of work to to make it into a a solid piece of drama. Ah, well. I've, I've never been afraid of a bit of hard work. Uh, more importantly, uh, a classic such as this, one would tweak Ben's nose a bit for making something derivative and uh, is just the sort of thing I hope uh, John is looking for as something that isn't Shakespeare again. Not that there's anything wrong with Shakespeare, but John left to go do, he wanted to go do more adventurous things. Mm. So I'm trying to find something adventurous in order to perhaps get him to this is a, a position on the stage. 
What adventurous it is. I've already discussed it with Lillian, and she has assured me that uh, for this purpose, price is no object. Oh. Well. <laughs> in that case, I mean... Not to mention, since I mentioned you by name to, Miss, to Mrs. Bayliss, being able to then report your success would be, let's say, quite the feather in your cap. <laughs> when he's looking away, Shaw takes a moment to like look at Anne and go, "Who?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you for telling me that. I wasn't aware. <laughs> he he seems he he seems to blithely accept this. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of you to share the secrets with me. Um, right. Well, I've no doubt we can find it for you. So let's talk price. Um, I would... <laughs> Bargain. <laughs> Bargain, yeah. Bargain. So... Um, well, the two of you negotiate for a while, and it becomes clear that uh, the the payment, both for the play and for your trouble, uh, would come out to definitely equating to a windfall for the bookstore, improving your credit rating by one, at least. I'm certain that we can, we can, um, well, I, 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 sh I shouldn't speak for Anne, but um, I, I, this, this is certainly within our, uh, our wheelhouse too. I, I suppose as a, as a fellow aficionado of the theater, I just want you to know that I don't think, I don't think the play is very good, but well, we'll, we'll certainly get it for you. But I mean, if, you, if you're basing that on Travers' expedition, I'm quite certain that it wasn't very good. But, but first I need to see the original to determine what steps may be taken henceforth. Yes, it, it seems that, um, well, essentially what, what we had, what Travis gave us was a bad quarto. It was, it was just uh, from, from memory. So Indeed. Um, Indeed. perhaps the original's better? Yeah, I mean... If his memory doesn't hold up, then it would make sense that there'd be a bunch of pieces missing. It didn't feel... It didn't hold whole. together well. Mm. Yeah, no. Mm. Do you have any requirements as to condition, other than legibility and completeness? Legible and complete would be lovely. Um, also something that our, our, our scribes here could readily make copies of. For the actors. Prompt books, that sort of thing. Hmm. We have we have an accord then. Consider consider us signed on. Excellent, excellent. I look forward to hearing from you. Um, this is still, of course, all in the planning stages. Our season is largely booked out for now, so no real rush. But do keep me apprised. Of course. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, and you as well. If all this goes well, we'll have to have you in for the for our winter gala, where you where I could make some introductions. That'd be lovely. Very kind of you. Well, Reese will see you out. Give me one second. Need to close the door. The storyteller's gone. What do we do? Run a muck. <laughs> Maggie turns to Sean and goes, "Best." Pocket watches in London out there. Keep your voice down. No. <laughs> mm. All right. So.
So, barring any uh, any side travel, you return to the shop to conspire amongst yourselves. Right. Well. So, I'm I'm gonna say this, and then I'm, then I'm gonna gonna drop it, but. That play wasn't just bad, it was it was a whole other kind of bad, not just artistically. Don't you I, think? Last night? I think I know what you mean. It was you this then. You say you didn't recognize the scene I was describing in Act One, Scene Two. I, 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 None of us I, just, I, I was I was distracted by the, the people that were a couple rows ahead of us, but I, I, I didn't ring a bell. Nobody was talking. What? Nobody was talking. No, the two what? people, the, the woman with the with the dark hair and she had a hat. <clears throat> no, the theater was still during that scene. Still and quiet. I mean, somebody shouted from the back, but I, like, that's not what you're talking about. It doesn't matter. So... It's not just what was on stage that was different. It's like we were in different theaters. Mm. I just, that's, but that's not how. Which makes sense for the production design, actually. I mean, it, not that it makes sense that we were seeing different plays, but, but, Sorry. but thematically, no, but thematically, it does make sense. The way that it was, it was, it was as if they were all characters from different plays. I mean, it, that doesn't explain, that doesn't explain how we could see different things, but. I guess. <laughs> it was just, it was just really odd production design and. I guess that's what they were thinking. I have to trust well, you. you. Well, I'm, I'm just it. I'm saying that, that I don't think I don't think it's just us. I think that that's something that that is 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 do, begs into the play. Do you think if if we if we got if we talked to other people in the audience, we'd get the same? Everybody saw something different. Should we look into that? We might. I'm, I don't like thinking about it, but if it helps. Like what do you do if you find out the answer is yes? I've, well, then, I'd, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm interested in another thing. What's that? I'm going downstairs. Uh... Uh... So... <laughs> So, over the summer, we didn't do anything about that, did we? It's just this is just still a big hole in the floor. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't awesome. even. It didn't even occur to Maggie to go down there and look at it. Nice. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Well, avoidance. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Just checking. Yeah. You know, yeah. The sewer, and it's like, okay. Nah. That's clearly where the bad stuff was what coming from. Go wrong. <laughs> Well, Shaw's like, well, hold on. Well, all right, she's going down. Let's just go down. She shouldn't be alone. I I retrieve a torch and head down. Okay, you uh, you have you have put a couple of uh, of planks over the hole uh, that oh. are lashed together. Actually, make a good trap door. Uh, Wander down into your, into your basement that you didn't know was there. They're greeting you uh, in the carved stone, the rows of benches, the slightly raised dais up front. And yes, sure enough, that is a, a faded and worn image of the yellow sign carved into the back, uh, of, carved into the back of the wall behind the dais. I'm pretty sure this is the first time Maggie's been down here. I yes, think that's right. Yes. Um, would an archaeology spend get me any new information? Um, I think you used archaeology on it before. Did I? 
Uh, yep. And so everything down here is is so old and worn. It it's clearly if you had to try and assign a date to it, it'd be maybe Roman Britain because it's all like weathered all to hell, uh, and there are like no identifying marks that uh, barely the, any tools were made or any tools were used. The, practically all the detail down here, with the exception of the faded. Uh, faded etching in the back wall is gone. Okay. Um, so this looks old. Quite. <sighs> what do you um? What do you think we should be looking for? I don't know. I was just. I'm confused that they used the same sign as this. Well, if it... We don't know anything about the King in Yellow yet. We don't know how old it is. True, and then. It just could be something from that. It's a weird coincidence, yeah, but... I don't know. I mean, someone might know something about the King in Yellow, but someone would have to ask the Keeper to use an investigative ability first. We're thinking... Whoa, we can do that? No. <laughs> no, I'm I, I'm looking at my um, I, I, have... like, I don't think I have anything useful here, yeah. So I have art mm -hmm. and then I have history. Mm -hmm. And would either of those be applicable here? Yes. History hey. uh, tells you in part because you you'd heard the name. In part it was because you heard the name of the play uh, mm -hmm. that night, and so that sort of triggered a memory in you. You you had just referenced it this morning before walking over there. So the King in Yellow appears in a couple of books as an obscure reference. Uh, the first reference is that it was printed in 1895 in France, and was immediately confiscated by French authorities as being scandalous. Ooh. <laughs> However. <laughs> <laughs> There's another reference that says it wasn't printed in France. It was translated into French oh, boy. in 1895 from some other language. And again, the French authorities uh, scooped it up. However, it was supposed to have uh, uh, crossed the pond into England and taken it by and been all, all the rage for it because it was something the French couldn't handle. <laughs> That's... So, King in Yellow, I think, is is French, right? And and um, late eighteen, mid eighteen nineties, I'd say. That's not that old. No, it's not that old, but it was. Um, it's really rare because um, it was it was scandalous, and so it got uh, confiscated, much much like uh, Doctor Faustus. Um, right. And uh, yeah, that doesn't explain the thing on the wall, though. No, no, not at all. Damn. I was hoping you would say something that made sense. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Put the pieces together. And that's not. Oh, I know what you mean. Trying to be mean. Yeah, you are. Uh, but, well, all right. Maybe a little. Well, maybe well, we can find a bit more about it in some newspaper clippings, then. Mm. I was going to say, the date does give us somewhere to start, which is good. Yeah, we can check um, Le Monde from that time period. That if it was, if it was pre performed, I know, I know about the publishing history, but I'm not as sure about the performance history, but that's easy enough to find. I'll also note that bibliography can be used to determine whether or not a text is available for sale. Oh, I, I will do the thing. Okay. <laughs> would you like to uh, use this? Would you like to use the ability? Or would you like to spend a point? Oh, I will spend a point. Okay. So, uh, and especially since you've been uh, diligently combing through catalogs, trying to to fill your head with what book is where. 
when Maggie talks about the book, you realize it's mentioned in a bunch of catalogs, but you've only seen one copy available. Um, despite the fact that a lots of that when it's advertised in the catalog, it says this is supposed to be a really hot property. But the only thing you've seen is that Sotheby's catalog lists one as potentially for sale in the estate in the uh, library of one Alexandra Golightly. <laughs> Cousin of Holly. <clears throat> Wonderful. You know what? I what? think I might know someone to talk to. Oh, good. I'll let you know this evening. I'll go find him. All right, then. Well, he's doing that. Maggie, do you want to head to the library or do you have something to do here? No, nah, library's fine. And you uh, you head to the library to try and find things on the, the King in Yellow? Indeed. <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> no, no, no worries at all. Okay. So a, uh, a, a long day's library use does net you one reference to the King in Yellow other than what uh, Miss McGill had already reported about the confiscation by French authorities. Apparently, there was a French village about 20 miles outside of Paris. Uh, name is not given of the village uh, that put on a production of the show uh, in a theater that is no longer there because shortly after the production, they burned down the theater and salted the earth <laughs> in a medieval fashion. However, your source here is you strikes you as somewhat unreliable, or there seem, does seem to be a lot of fantastic tales in here about the French overreacting to things. Well, they kind of do. Mr. Hughes, what are you uh, what are you hoping to do here today? Well, I'm hoping to find the home of the Golightlies. Oh, well. Um, and uh, what skill would you like to use to, to start on that endeavor? Um, the knowledge hasn't failed me before. So, the knowledge isn't going to tell you like where particular people live, but a quick credit rating check uh, tells you that, the, these, that she is of the Mayfair go lightlies. Uh, however, uh, since you have to ask around a little bit uh, in order to establish sort of the social pecking order, uh, you also end up speaking to one of your police contacts who, uh, who tells you through cop talk that Alexandra Golightly uh, is not currently living in her, in her family's home in Mayfair. She oh. is currently a resident of Bethlehem Royal Hospital in South London. Oh. Where she has been committed. <clears throat> well, so so following into that, um, well, who then would have her her things? I'm I'm after a, a particular book. You see that I'm given to understand she's in possession of. So I need to know who to speak to in order to find this thing. Do you happen to know? They don't appear to. You're going. You're going to need to do investigation on so, in some other angle in order to find out what she was committed for and who might have her stuff. Does he? Does he know what she was committed for? Uh, your your contact does not. Okay. Your contact only knows that she was she was hauled away to the loony bin. <sighs> of course, she was. All right. Well, um, 
I guess we're going to, uh, I guess we're going to the loony bin then. <laughs> okay. So, because you have a, uh, because you have a, a, at least a point in law, you are aware that someone in the family is going to have to vouch for you if you're going to speak to anyone, if you're going to try to speak to her or to anyone about her at Bethlehem. Um, I was actually going to pretend to be a cop, but that's... Okay. <laughs> because that'll, you know, go real well. Sure. <laughs> With the way my dice have been behaving today. So, and, you and have... That, you, that suit. You, and you, uh, my suit. <laughs> you catch a cab to, uh, to Bethlehem Royal Hospital. Mm. And will you be... Will you be using Cop Talk, or will you be spending a point out of Cop Talk? I will spend a point of Cop Talk. You spend a point of Cop Talk. All official. You come in, you act all official, um, maybe even flash a badge that might say special police on it somewhere. Um, <laughs> I made that. And within a few minutes, a tall man with a thinning blonde hair and a beard... Um, Comes out straightening his high, approaches you, goes, My name is Dr. Highsmith. May I help you? Yes. I had some questions for uh, an Alexander Golightly. I see. Uh, Miss Golightly has been our guest for 24 months now. Um, I'm sorry, have you made an appointment? No. I'm afraid I'm not. Um, there, it's an ongoing inquiry, you see. Um, I see. Well, I'm afraid Miss Golightly is indisposed, having taken her medication for the day. However, I can arrange an appointment at a later date. That would be convenient. May I call your station? That. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, I can also provide you with a look at her files, so that would be if that would be efficacious. Well, given where we are, I don't know how helpful she was going to be to me in the first place, if you know what I mean. So perhaps her files would uh, shed some light on my questions. I, of course, will allow you to peruse them, but they, they do have to stay here. Oh, of course. I understand completely. Please follow me. I must, con I must admit to some surprise. Um, haven't heard from the police since she was, she was committed, and uh, the police released her, not, char not charging her with a crime. Interesting. I mean, there, were, there was no physical evidence... In physical evidence, despite her confession to the murders. We've made some advances on the case since then. I see. Well, if, if you might perhaps share one professional to another, that might assist in my diagnosis of her, of her condition. As it happens, her petition on order comes up for review in November. Oh, does it now? Well, this is all news to me. I have just been assigned to this case, so I'll need to see the files before I can speak to anything. Yes, of course. Leads you to his office, opens the filing cabinet, through, pulls out a, a rather thick uh, folder, places it on the desk. Um, obviously, most of this is medical terminology. If there's anything I can uh, clarify for you, please do let me know. <laughs> if I have any questions, I'll ask. Yes, of course. All right. What we got? So, sure enough, Alexandra Galitely has been committed uh, since late October of 1932. There are references to a police incident and the death of her father and brother. Though details are scant in her psychological, in her psychiatric record. The 
the one thing you find in her history is you're sort of skimming is she's listed as uh, having episodes of panic while asleep, uh, rapid breathing, pulse, dilated pupils. And that she experienced those until she was prescribed a laudanum. And the episodes subsided in April of, of uh, 1933, but then recurred in October of 1933, at which time she was given two three-month prescriptions of laudanum that carried her until April of 1934. And the last entry you see says that her episodes began again on October 17th of this year. That, that being two days ago. Or actually, given the afternoon, no, yesterday, the day you went to the play. So, I see here, um, there's a record of her, um, her lapse. Yes. As of yesterday. Yes. She's, she's still on the London. Oh, yes. Interesting. One fluid ounce a day, yes. Mm. Tell me about these episodes. What are they like? Well, Other than the physical, does she say anything? No, she. it's more of a panic attack. Um, I'm not sure what I expected to find, honestly, but I Neither think this has been helpful. If I have any further questions for you, uh, I will be in touch. We'll be here. Have a pleasant evening. You as well. <clears throat> All right. And so you, uh, you gather back up at the shop. Alfie has managed to sell six books on the tribes of, of Sussex today. Good job, Alfie. Go home. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mom. Good boy, but not very bright. I was like that once. And <laughs> like pointedly does not respond to that. <laughs> well, I didn't You're muted, by the way, Jen. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> They were too busy losing it. Um, <laughs> what was I saying? Uh, no, I'm losing it. Any fruits of your labor today? I was about to ask you the same, but I'll start. Um, so it turns uh, out... Uh, I recall to mention the King in Yellow in a catalogue at the Sotheby, um, purported to belong to an Alexander Goliath. Attempting to call on Miss Golightly uh, led me to the knowledge that she's been, um, well, they sent her to the loony bin, uh, evidently for some murders. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, of her, uh, her father and her brother, if I, if I recall. <laughs> so she's um, not in a state to talk. So tomorrow, I'll have to find another way around that. Let's see who has the book right now. Well, her father and her brother, does she have any other living relatives? That's what I'm going to find out. 
If we look up their obituaries, it'd probably say what other family there is. Do we still call it a book if it's a play? Is it? Do we yeah. call it a play or what's manuscript? Well, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Too many syllables. Ah, uh, you told me that word. It's a good word. It is. All right, then. And said, feeling vindicated about her opinion. <laughs> 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 Well, the only thing we discovered new was that there was a production of the play which resulted in the burning down of the theatre and, in proper frog style, the salt of the earth. Oof. What do eggs have to do with this? Sorry, go on. <laughs> I mean, at some point, we do need to weigh the getting of the play versus the financial. Yeah, it's a lot of money. It is a lot of money, I know. <sighs> but, and and I want to be helpful, I do. But... This is, this play is, it's bad. And it's not just bad artistically. Well, so? If the same thing happens, then the worst... Then thing we'll know! Not <laughs> won't we? It'll be our fault! Then, and well, we'll know! Well, well, hold on. If the same thing happens, then... The worst we've ultimately done is ruin a man's career and burn down a theater. Which mm, did you a... did you see the riot that was happening? Well, yeah, but the the constabulary handled it. I mean, it was not great. But this was this was a bad translation of it. What's the real one like? I mean, I don't know. I know the numbers behind it. That's a lot of zeros, right? I mean... Oh, no. You can't just look the other way. What we could... Oh. You want to make a fake one. Oh, I do! I do! <laughs> I know you. I know, I know you too. <laughs> well, we yeah. Can do that. Yeah, I can't I mean, do it. He doesn't seem to know what the actual source material is. He's basing all of this on what Travers wrote. So, right. if you do something similar to what Travers wrote, then. I, c I could do something better than what Travers well, wrote. Excuse oh, me. I, I believe you can. I believe you can. There's some semblance of a story in it, maybe. And anyway. not meaning to doubt, you're just, just verifying. Your, your French is good enough to, to carry the writing of a play. Uh, well, well, we might need to consult the professor, I think. Yes, yes, I think the professor speaks for... I, I, could, I could certainly write a translation of it. But not maybe in French. So what you're suggesting is that you'll write a play and the professor will translate it and we'll sell that. Oh, we should still find the original thing. You know, for to make yeah. sure it's authentic, yes. Right, yeah. And so what you'd be putting out into the world then would be something better than what Travers wrote and therefore possibly more efficacious. Mm-hmm. Well... Uh <laughs> Better, better written, and therefore possibly more efficacious. Possibly, I don't know, but but probably not as as efficacious as the real thing. Oh right, no, I'm I'm just verifying your intention. But 
But I do agree with something Mr. Hughes has said, and that is that regardless, we need to find the original film. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's concentrate on that for now. So we need to find family members. I do. All right, well, why don't the two of you take care of that? I think I might have something else to do. You be careful. Whatever it is. Do you think I'm up to no good, Mr. Hughes? No, I think we are. But <laughs> yeah. You're the one who... It's possible that we're a bad influence on you and it's rubbing off, ma'am. Oh. Well, that's kind of you to say. It makes presumptions about my nature. Right then. <laughs> hey. <laughs> what are we doing, kids? Um, we could start by, uh, as we could, um, if, if you want, we can start by going to, um, the library and looking up, um, we've got at least an approximate time that she was committed. So then that, that would put the death of her father and brother shortly before that. We can look up the obituary and see all of that information. Yeah. Check the, um, uh, mess messenger. We've got a link. Oh, 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 oh. When, when, you, when you deploy a research oh, hey! skill. Ding, ding. When you deploy a research skill to uh, to look up stuff on the, the on Alexander Golightly and the Golightly murders, mm. you find a news archive, a report even. Mm. Got an address right away, which is good. Mm-hmm. Discovering that Mr. Herbert Golightly and his son George were in fact murdered on or around the 14th of October, 1932. Now, wife sounds like it's just got uh, this Graham person. Yeah, a brother. A well-known merchant banker. Well, well, hmm. you straightened my imaginary tie. <laughs> and Mr. Hughes, the knowledge tells you for that that for that region, any funeral, presuming they're Church of England, which they seem like they seem like the sort of folk who are, yeah. um, would be held at St. Peter's. in Victoria. All right, so we have a couple of angles. 17th October, two years. Yeah, so that's, um, so what I didn't tell Anne. Oh. <laughs> um, I went to, um, I went, I went to, yeah, um, to see if I could talk to her, you know, just in case, might as well. Sure. Um, pretended to be a cop or whatnot. Uh, did it work? It did work. It did work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I can scrape it together when I need to. Um, but no, point is, um, she, um, She'd been having these, they called them episodes, you know, they're going crazy like, um, I think the doctor described it as like a panic attack. She was, oh. right, 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 right. So, um, 
So those have mostly gone away. They prescribed us some laudanum. She was doing fine. Until yesterday. Oh, day, well, sorry, day before. 17th. And what happened? Well, we were at that play. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like a funny coincidence, don't you think? Well, also, two years since her father died. Well, since she killed her father and brother. Well, right. And she's the one who's got the original play, so... You see what I mean? No, I do. I do. It's just weird. It's completely weird. So find the brother? So find the brother. You two go looking up Mr. Graham Golightly, who does in fact live in Mayfair. While you're doing that, Miss Bailey, what are you up to? You're mu first you're muted. So, well, this says that um, the play is running for three weekends. So, does, is there a second night? So, you go over to the theater. Yes. And the posters have been taken down, Ooh. and a notice has been put up that the that the producers have withdrawn funding. And the show is closed. Um, the okay. So, is anybody about? No, the theater is shuttered. Okay. Having originally been planned to to hold hold the show tonight, and now that show is no more. Right. Well, I don't have the knowledge, so. Um, I will take a walk around. Okay. Um, not having the knowledge, I'm just going to try and do the footwork to sort of, if, if I were a suddenly out of work actor, where would I be spending this afternoon? Okay. If only you knew someone who knew where how to work <laughs> actors. Yeah, but you guys are busy. So. So, you wander around for a while, and this being 1934 in London, you find a, a diverse array of out of work actors. Yeah, um, but I'm not unfortunately, none of the ones you're looking okay. for. All right. Now that being said, mm. in your in your growing frustration. It does occur to you and to your bibliography that you have heard the name Alexandra Golightly before. Because you periodically uh, open up catalogs to see these, these little vanity projects that sometimes uh, posh people do for themselves. Alexandra Golightly, in fact, published a book of poetry in 1929. It has a German title, Der Wanderer durch den See. Yeah, I can't spell that. So, I guess I'll... Do I... I I'm, you already gave me information for bibliography. Can I find this thing? Um, Can I, Do I have it? Do I have it back at the shop using my... <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Okay. Um, yeah. In this case, it was a it was a tiny little print run. Uh, there are no copies presently for sale. But you just the name stuck out to you, and you flip through a couple of catalogs, and you do find a reference. Uh, Whitehall published an edition of this po published the first and only edition of this small poetry book in 1929. Um, hmm. I right, come back to me in a minute. Okay. Get back over here to the uh, the troublemakers. <laughs> Hello. It is not it is not difficult at all uh, to to suss out the the townhome of one Mr. Graham Golightly.
in a very nice, very Tony section of Mayfair. Essentially, a block of white stone with several black doors in it. Uh, and his is like the third one down from the corner. So we want to just come right out and tell him that we're looking for a book? I don't see the harm in it. Yeah. All right. This is your business. I'm just here for moral support. Yeah, so. You approach front door, opened by a butler. Takes in the two of you and your credit rating. Yikes. I help you. Yes. Uh, we were hoping to speak to uh, Mr. Graham Golightly. May I inquire what the matter is? We've been commissioned to find a book. It's about his sister. Um, we... Uh, we're looking to come to some terms. Do you have a card, sir? I do. He holds out a small silver plate. Please wait here. Shuts the door in your face. Maggie has been holding in, rolling her eyes so hard, <laughs> yeah. and she can't help it anymore. <laughs> yeah, Shaw turns to her a merchant banker. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes pass. <sighs> Ten minutes pass. You want to go to the pub? Twenty minutes pass. Let's go. Yeah, he's got the card. Let's go. All right. So, what do we think? Do we think he's too snobby, or do we think he's actually hiding something? It could be either. It could be both. It could be both. <laughs> ah, it's never easy, is it? Jack doesn't usually do jobs in this neighborhood, right? Uh, no, no, no. Most of uh, most of Jack's contacts are in the uh, the as uh, in sketchy town. Some guys might refer to them as the middle class climbers of the Golden Dawn. As you uh, take in a pint and consider your options, Miss Bailey, do you have something? I'm I'm trying to figure out if I can use correspondence to, to see if there's a copy or a fragment or something. Mm. Some some piece of this book. Okay. Uh well you certainly could. Uh you just need to you would need to create to whom you are to whom you are writing. Okay. While you're pondering that, yes, thank what you. What are we doing? Hmm. <clears throat> um. I, I will add uh, to your uh, to your law knowledge, uh, Mr. Hughes. As long as uh, Miss Golightly is committed, her legal capacity to sell is in question but not immediately uh, out of bounds. Mm -hmm. okay. It depends on what she's committed for and what her doctor thinks. Right. Well, I've spoken to the doctor. I can go back to the doctor anytime I want. Mm -hmm. I left that door wide open. So, that's good. So, she could say that tell us that she wishes to sell it and then in theory you'd have to give it over, right? In theory? Hey, men with that much money, you've got to be careful. I know. They, gotta, they can get away with a lot. I know. I'd love to go in and have a look around, but mm, Risky. Very. 
I, I wouldn't risk it unless we could confirm that the book was there. That's true. Then maybe I'd think about it. That's fair. That's that's completely fair. Because if we go in and we risk everything and we come out and then there's nothing, it, then there, yeah. there, that, there's no point in that. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, so. Hmm. Well, another thing that we can do is we can um, send a letter of inquiry uh, to him from the shop saying that, that we've received word that you might be in possession of a book that we are interested in acquiring. That's true. I mean, I prefer to do these things in person, but he's sure. it's, being a well, yeah. snob, so... Yeah, it's worth a try. Well, your your penmanship is way better than mine, so after you. <laughs> Her penmanship is anybody's penmanship. She wants it to be. <laughs> Indeed, it is. <laughs> so, I've got stationery back at the shop. Yep, Anything else you can think we can do? What else do you? I don't know what. I mean, how do we make it nicer? <laughs> well, I mean, this is this is this is a legitimate thing that we're actually doing here. Right? <laughs> no, that's that's why it's not my area. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So fine. Let's let's go back to the shop, and I'll I'll write it up and get Anne's approval for it, and, and so it off. so my book counts close out October the eighteenth. I'm sorry, October the nineteenth. With some letter writing. Actually, bum, bum. Miss Bailey, I, I I was gonna call. I mean, we can huh? do that thing. And to whom do you place a phone call? Um, how much leeway do I have here? Uh, tell me what you want to do. I'll tell you whether or not you need to like dial it back. Correspondence, okay. you can, you can get away with a lot. It's it's a bit right. like preparedness in that. So, there is a the, the magazine of the Poetry Society, of the mm -hmm. Poetry Review, um, which was founded in 1912. And the first editor was Harold Monroe, but he was ousted after a year by, Wikipedia tells me, alarmed, more conservative-minded trustees. Okay. So, I... <laughs> He went on, he had a, a shop um, called the Poetry Bookshop. So being apparently a sort of weird, um, alarming figure, he might carry on a correspondence with a woman bookseller. Sure. Um, and would probably have his fingers on the pulse of anything poetry related in London. All right. So you spend a point of correspondence to create yes. Harold Monroe. We will uh, we will fill in his stats once I review what's how many points he gets in what. Um, I have an idea of what he's going to spend. So you call up the poetry bookshop. Yes. Phone rings for a good long while. Before finally picking up, Poetry Bookshop, can I help you? Uh, look at you speak to Mr. Monroe, please. This is Anne Bailey calling. Miss Bailey, what can I do for you today? I'm looking for a particular volume, and I know that would poetry not be in my usual fare, I should ask you about it. Go on then. Do you know the name Alexandra Golightly? Oh, Lord. That bad, is it? So, you're looking for the Wanderer by the Sea, or whatever it is in bloody German. Right. Oh, I don't know if I can even... I don't know anybody who's even got a copy of it. It's this tiny little thing, white cover, about 50 pages. <sighs> Do 
Do you know anything about it? That it's supposed to be like half dream journal, half in German, and there are authors more than half crazy. Well, it sounds about right. So, why, I mean, I know it was a small print run, but why aren't there any copies about? You think people would be... Because she didn't, she didn't get it printed to, to sell. She's, she's a tough. She had it printed to satisfy her ego and handed it out to friends. Yeah, but you'd think those friends then would be looking to unload it if someone was looking. If they have, they haven't They haven't come through me. Um, well, if you keep an ear out for me, would you? I can make a call or two. Of an interested party. I'll see what I can find. You're so good to me. Do what I can. I'll talk to you later, unless there's something I can do for you. Nothing just now. Poetry not be in your area. Not my area, no. Cheers, love. All right. All right. And Maggie, what are you putting in this letter? Um, I'll actually um, consult with Anne because this okay. is this is a legitimate <laughs> matter. So we went to talk to the brother banker fellow, and um, he uh, they uh, yeah he, his butler took our card and then slammed the door in our face and didn't come back. So what we're thinking is perhaps if we sent a letter from the bookstore saying it's our understanding you're in possession of a volume that we would like to purchase, that maybe that would be uh, a way of, of opening up a conversation. Unless you think we should call on the telephone or do something else, this is actually really more your thing. Well, it's more likely to actually get it if you send it by post. The phone caller might be intercepted by staff as well. They're not right. going to read his mail. And if he does have a man to read his mail, it's still going to the right person. Mm -hmm. So sending a letter is fine. Uh, now, but I'm, I'm finding this a bit odd because normally your cousin, he gets through doors. Usually he does. However, you are both cognizant that normally in order for a Shaw to get through a door, he needs a book, the person on, he has a book, the person on the do other side of the door wants. Once. He can get anybody who's a potential customer. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we don't know enough about Mr. Golightly to know his interests, if he has any in books. How to milk your crazy sister out of her inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have that in stock? I think. <laughs> That's the only interest of his that I can think of off the top of my head. Hey, you did good. <laughs> <laughs> we presume the man has interests. Everyone does. But, fine. No, go ahead and send the letter. I can see the little wheels turning. What, what you're thinking? I'm, I'm just confused about something. What's that? The unavailability of a book of minor poetry by a crazy noble girl. She wrote poetry. Okay. She did. Was it a legitimate press, or or one of these vanity presses? Oh, she did it for herself. Ah, well, I mean, they, she's probably got a whole box of them in, in her back bedroom or something. Except that she wouldn't, then her brother would. Uh, yeah, that's true. Well. But if you were trying, if you were trying, say, to get her inheritance, why not sell off this? Because they're probably trash. Have you read the things that, they, that that kind of person writes? Why would anyone want to buy that? Well, no, they're nobles, so maybe they wouldn't. I was thinking there's a murder. 
Oh, yes. Oh, you can make a big buzz about it. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah that. that's true. But 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 that would be that, that would be scandalous. And of course, people oh, of that class would not want to have, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They wouldn't want to, that's and that's that might be it. That it may be that the, the this brother has uh, bought up all the uh, copies Ooh, to get rid true. of them because they're so terrible and embarrassing to the family. Ooh. Could be. Right. Could be. And uh, Miss Bailey, the the pro the prospective existence of a woman who appears to be. One who doesn't fit in tickles something in the back of your mind as though it is now a, a soft driver that you want to go see her. Mm. <laughs> well? I wonder if she remembers any of it. Or... Did you find out if she's no use? She's lucid at all. The record didn't say that she wasn't. Maybe she's still writing. I don't know. Do, do don't they know. let people have pens and things? I was going to say I'm not sure what kind of um, you know liberties she has. I would think that would depend on the. Extent they, of their. It, it did. It did sound like from the records that um, their their treatment was going well. So it's possible. So they, they've might... given her some more freedoms. Yeah. Give her something soft and a piece of paper. Maybe not a sharp fountain pen or the like. Since she's in for murder. Or she thinks she's writing poetry in crayon. What would the poetry be any less? Uh, I'm just saying I know people who would be very into that. <laughs> uh, the whole uh, well, they're, they're your sort, Maggie. The whole like, ooh, it's ooh. It, was, it was done, you know, from the asylum. Or whatever. Right, crazy uh, people. <laughs> Not that I'm saying, well, I'm, oh, kind of, how I'm kind of saying that, yeah. You kind of are, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> I just don't think that a woman's words would be worthless, depending on what they were written in. <clears throat> well. Is all I'm saying. <clears throat> but that's not even my point. My point is, if she's still writing... Then there might be clues, especially if she's crazy. Well, and here's here's what here's what we can do. Uh, she hired a vanity press at one point to, to print her poems. Right. And if we wanted to, we could say, "Hey, if you'll give us this book, we'll publish your recent works." And I could at least make one that looked like it was official. I, I'd appreciate. I appreciate that you can do that. I don't really need an official copy. Uh, but, but, do you think the press would still have it? Possibly. I don't know. That's 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 a good question, uh, GM. I should probably know whether or not a press would keep copies of something. So either uh, art or bibliography will tell you if it was a vanity project, probably, probably not. Probably not. Okay. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think that they would keep um, something that they were not planning on reprinting. No, you're probably right. All right. Well, let's go that route then. You, keep, you send your letter and try and get in touch with the brother. And let's see if we can get in to see Miss Colightly. All right. All right. Um, so I'll, I'll call Bedlam then and um, right. set up an appointment. 
Um, I should mention before I do that. Um, <laughs> I went. I went. I went to Bedlam under very specific um, um, terms. You see, uh, so they. Um, well, I guess the long and short of it is they think I'm a copper. So, um, just you know, play along. They they just think that. Well, he did oh, have a badge. Because I, yeah. <laughs> Maggie's handiwork, yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> it's all very, you know. Official looking. Right. <laughs> did you just try and make like it was above board? Well, well yeah. yeah. Well, right. To them, right, you see? To them. <laughs> right. It is. That's the point of the deception. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Fine. 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 <laughs> I just don't, don't picture Maggie over Anne's shoulder doing this. <laughs> exactly. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Maggie writes a letter. Shaw yep. places a call. Um. Dr. Highsmith's secretary uh, informs you that the, the patient you wish to speak to would be most lucid right around noon. Would that be sufficient? Of course. All right. So you have an appointment for noon on the 20th. Everyone goes to bed. In the morning, mail goes out. Does anyone want to do anything in the morning before, before they head to the madhouse? All right, who's going? Yeah, and and we 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 would have worked this out beforehand so that they would know how many people I'm bringing, absolutely, and under what circumstances, just so we're not yeah no no, no, no problem. All right, well this time, um, so give me a give me like the two sentence version of what you've told them about who Miss Bailey and Miss McGill are in relation to your your legal inquiry. Well. Uh, any... Miss Bailey might have a suggestion. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> If you wanted one. Oh, well, go ahead. <clears throat> um, it, it... Would I could, um, probably passably... Pa <laughs> She's she's struggling not to say pretend. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I guess you're not thinking counterfeit. I was a combat nurse. This is not entirely true. I was a combat nurse. Oh. And I've some understanding because of that of. Um, shell shock and the like. So, you've been told that you um, might have trouble communicating because of the medication, and I would have some expertise in dealing with patients like that as a psychologist. Well, that's a lot more detailed than what do I thought. Do you really want to pretend to be a psychologist among the bunch of psychologists there? I've got enough. All right. I trust you. Also, I think we have a book on it if you um, want to brush up. But. <laughs> All right. So who am I? <laughs> That's a great question. Because I knew I had something for Bailey. Not sure. Not sure about you. Well, what was your idea for me? Oh, that you were a shrink. You just said it better than I would. <clears throat> um, I can... Uh, I don't know what coppers do. I don't know who they hang hmm. out with. I mean, yeah, I can I mean, be your secretary. Does, 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 does cop talk give me any... Any angles I can work here? So you're you're still a few years out from uh, 
the the women's police corps. Yeah. Uh, but she could be a nurse in training. Mm. Could be. But go ahead, Jay. I'm sorry. I know that 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 would work. Also, uh, just a a male policeman bringing a female chaperone. To ah. Speak, to, to speak yes. to a uh, a female patient. Oh. I could be a, a like a secretary from the police that is going along because you're meeting with a a woman. A woman, indeed. Yes. How, how dare I? Unmarried. Okay. Well, yeah. No, no. All right then. That seems to work. Yeah. All right. Then you uh, late that morning you head out to South London and do Bethlehem Royal Hospital. Okay, um, now I have to ask this question. <laughs> I'm driving. <laughs> it's really too long for a walk. Well, what? I mean, there are plenty of ways. I, just, I can just, I'll just, I'll just go. It's, no, you guys, I'll, I'll meet you there. It's, it's all right. By noon, I can, I can make it. I'm looking my. My wrist. Yeah, good. Good anachronism. Good job. Not for your swatches. Not for my pay grade. <laughs> Not for your pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hughes, get in the car. What? Maggie, you got a flask. Yep, right here. Okay. Here you go. Mr. Hughes, if you would give us a stability test, please. Sure. Because I'm crazy now. Uh, hey, five. You take some deep breaths to keep the window open. And some you sort of the dog hanging out the win window a couple of times. And you get there without issue. This is a relatively new building for Bethlehem. Um, but the architecture is still kind of stark. Um, the walls are, are top cream, uh, lower are kind of khaki. Um, Shaw and Anne, maybe a little yellowing. Just the, the thought leaps into your mind almost unbidden. Um, parquet floors. But the, the light of the walls is a stark contrast with the dark stained furniture. The chairs and tables that are around are a very dark color. And the contrast is, is almost startling to look at. Dr. Highsmith greets you all, shakes your hands warmly, welcomes you back to his office. Is my understanding you wish to speak to Miss Golightly, is that correct? Yes, yes. Well, she is a, a troubled young woman, but I do believe um, her condition has dramatically improved in the two years she's been here. In fact, when her hearing comes up in November, we don't have a date yet, but I do intend to recommend her release. Um, and what of the, um, the relapse? Has, has that resolved? Well, and he looks slightly askance at Anne. And those of you with assess honesty, he's actually, it feels like he's reticent to talk about his diagnosis hmm. because he seems kind of proud of it and might be afraid that someone else is going to snatch it out from under him. <clears throat> Suffice it to say that I feel that her current program, complete with prescriptions, would be sufficient to return her to society. Now, uh, just a few rules uh, before we begin. Um, I'm going to send my secretary, who's going to take a transcription of the conversation. Um, and I must insist that you don't pass her anything uh, specific, certainly anything to write with. Um, she's been passed pencils that she wasn't supposed to have before. Um, and so we've forbidden those because she used them to dig a hole in the wall. Uh, therefore, no pencils, please. Was it a manic behavior or was she trying to escape? I think she might have been trying to communicate with the person in the next cell. Um, do you mind if I know who's in that cell? Um, Could be important. 
No, that's uh, Miss Janice Hallowell. And um, is her condition similar, or? Um, I'm sorry, that's privileged information. I see. What were the other rules? I'm sorry. You the princess. Now you both talked over each other. You started giving rules. Ah, um, please don't make physical contact. Um, and if an orderly gives you an instruction at any time, please obey it. If we wanted her to write something for whatever reason, um, would it be permissible to give her something soft, like um, I don't no. know, like charcoal? No. No. Understood. Okay, please follow me. And he leads you out of the office. You start walking. Um, he leads you across a, an open yard towards a uh, towards a separate a a separate wing, which you begin to suss out is is the the women's wing. Um, when a, a nurse approaches him, uh, tallish man, uh, sort of thin, uh, with a thinning blonde hair on top. Thank you, thank you, pardon, uh, Doctor. May I have a word? Not now, Evans. Can I get anybody who has it to make a sense trouble? Mm. <laughs> God damn it! I need to learn to start spending. That's one. That's a one. That's a three. That's a three. And that was weird, but you can't really put your finger on why. Ah. And you are led, the uh, the hallway is, the hallway you are led into is just a series of doors. Looks like it, it could be a, a, di a slightly dingy hotel. But you did say it's a relatively new building. Yes. Okay. Dr. Highsmith leads you to a door and pulls out a set of keys, unlocks it, admits the three of you and his secretary, who uh, sits down and opens up a, a pad to start start taking notes. When the three of you walk in, the woman in the chair in front of you is in a linen nightgown. She looks to be in her mid-30s. Her hair is flaxen, though there's maybe only about a half inch of it all the way around her head. Um, she's thin. She's sort of staring at her hands. Her, she, when she looks up, her Ice blue eyes sort of are a little startling because you weren't looking at her. And she looks up and goes, Arthur? She looks at the four people who enter. None of you appear to be the Arthur she mentioned, so she just sort of slumps back down. The bed uh, is small and small with uh, thin medical sheets. Uh, there is a table uh, behind her on which are stacked four books. And other than the chair she is sitting in, the bed, and the table, uh, there is also a, uh, a porcelain chamber pot in the corner. And that appears to be the entire furnishing of this room. Um, in what I hope is a like, you know, professional kind of manner, I'm going to address the secretary. Um, when I ask the question, and who is Arthur? He looks up at you over his glasses and goes, I'm afraid I don't know. Hmm. Two orderlies bring in chairs for the three of you. And then the door is shut, and it's the three of you, the secretary, and the and Alexandra. Who is staring diligently at her lap? Miss Colightly. When are you expecting Arthur? He does not appear to respond. Mm. What about All right. Hmm? 
What about the books? What's she reading? Are you asking me or are you speaking in character? I'm talk talking to, to Anne. Oh. As though... I'm going to ask her then. Read any good books? Continues to stare at her lap. Mm. Uh, uh, the books are the books are spine out and visible. There are there are five of them. Uh, and those of you with art immediately recognize and bibliography. So all three of you recognize them as books of poetry. Uh, they are from our ghostly enemy by Robert Graves. The Freaks, An Ideal of Suburbia by Pinero. Poems, 1918 to 1921 by Ezra Pound. And two books by Edward Arlington Robinson, Collected Poems and The Man Who Died Twice. Does anybody like what would even cover that? Um, um, you know, being I'm able to you. some poetry. What do you Fine. try you know to what? do? Nothing I have. <laughs> Maybe bibliography, but I already spent that. So, so well, so you, no. sorry, go ahead. Do you mind if I look at your books, miss? I'm going to presume she doesn't... She does not reply. Reply. So I'm going to get up and pick up whichever one is easiest to get to. So okay. on top, I don't know how they're stacked. On, but, top is, on top is From Our Ghostly Enemy by Robert Graves. Um, which, uh, the books all appear to be in good quality. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, at least, has looks to have margin notes written in pencil. Various things sketched throughout the book. I thought she wasn't allowed a pencil, I say to the secretary. She, she's not. Being locked in a room is inconvenient. It means I cannot finish my work, and so I cannot go where I would like to go. You know, few writers have the ability to write honestly. Truths are used for entertainment only, and that is a strange concept. It barely grazes what is of import. Such a writer is like a man whose only concern is to hide his ignorance. Willful misrepresentation, a shut mind, closed eyes, a tight mouth, and bold fists. It's not enough to have the ability to bring your intellect to bear like a light in the darkness, like a sane man in a world of madness. It's... Uh... <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, I'm just just as a clarification. Um, sure. I assume that the uh, the accent switching was yes. entirely deliberate and yes, that's it. Making sure. And is that what you do? Shine a light in the darkness. He does not reply. Does that get any sort of like physical reaction, or is she just staring? No, she is okay. staring at her lap. She didn't. Ha she didn't even look up actually to speak to you. She's just muttering to herself. So I'm gonna um, look at some place that has marginalia, mm -hmm. and read that passage out loud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You read a line, and the phrase, I stand on the shores of Holly and look at distant Carcosa, passes through your lips. And she now she looks up and looks right at you. Uh-oh. I don't like it. Have, have you seen the pallid mask? Have you been down by the lake and seen the beauty and felt the righteousness of it all? Edward said to work only with him. Are you with Corey? Why are they not here? Is, is this the year? Once in 5,000 years has Quarry bought 
the king in yellow? Is he already among us? And then she stands up and, and leans in next to your ear and whispers, Have you seen the yellow sign? Yeah, it's in our basement. <laughs> nope, never heard of it. Don't know what it is. Nope. <laughs> Doesn't look like anything. No, 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 no. It doesn't look, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like anything to me. <laughs> but no. And what if I have? She brightens as though you are immediately soulmates. She puts her arm on your shoulder, puts her hand on your shoulder, sorry. This, what Edwards and I are doing harms no one. But I have been worrying about Miriam Corey and the conversations we had. She sits down and suddenly affects it almost a proper... I, I think that, despite what Edwards might think, Corey is right. The King in Yellow has called the White Acolyte, has called himself the White Acolyte. I don't think he will stay away. So here is a kindness I would like you to pass on to him for when he sees that the king does not offer what he hopes. To divert the king's attentions away from our earth and back upon the dream city, he must think of Casilda's song. The stars that burn their charcoal death shrink back. They feel the hoary breath of he who ransoms great Carcosa. He flees where queen and prophet met where twin suns fall but never set, escapes the tomb, lost, Carcosa. Hmm. Sort of falls back into that rocking rhythm and falls silent again. I'm just presuming that that face is in character. <laughs> the secretary finishes uh, copying it all down in shorthand. Well, do you think you can get anything else out of her, Tishaw? I think that was quite enlightening. Along with, and so here's what I need to do. Okay. And I don't know that I have the skills for this or what they would even be, but I am going to make eye contact with Maggie mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as I put the book down, not where it was, and attempt to communicate that this should come with <laughs> Maggie's, Maggie's, yeah. So, to that end, I'm then going to turn to the secretary and mm -hmm. interrogate him about. Uh, she just said a lot of things. Did you get all that? Now you better be sure you got every word. And I am putting on Irish mom. <laughs> All right, so the Irish mammy assaults the poor secretary yeah. while uh, someone tries to uh, tries to make a filch roll. Ooh. Yeah, let's let's drop three on it. All right, yeah, there we go. And I rolled a three. Gives you a six. Yep. The book goes right into your purse, and the the harsh interrogation brings the door open, and a couple of orderlies walk in. Everything's fine. I'm just checking on quality of product. We are getting a copy of that, aren't we, officer? Dr. Highsmith steps in and says, yes, of course. Um, I should also like to mention, have any of you spoken to Dr. Trollope at all? Sorry, don't know the name. He looks at you oh, and then oh. he's thrown at their head. Uh -oh. oh, shit. You're investigating this crime and you haven't spoken to the Golightly's family doctor. Well, I did tell you I was new to this, did I not? I've just recently been assigned to this case. I'm glad you mentioned the name. I would like that person's number, please. Oh, we've got it at the station. 
Give me a. Well, I could look it up, but it would be easiest, I think. Would you please roll reassurance? Sure. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Spend, 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 spend. Sorry, you think I have reassurance? I have reassurance. Yes. Roll me a d6 there. Yeah. Bold copper, you. Uh huh. I've got a badge and everything. I'm a big kid. Uh, five. 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 <sighs> Muttering something about youth being wasted on the young. He gestures as though it's time for you to go. Armed hey. with this new information. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to, going to say thank you so much for your time, sir. Good evening. You walk your way out of Bethlehem Royal Hospital, armed with you don't even know what. And that's where we're going to stop for tonight. Hey. Um, I have a copy of the transcript of what she said uh, to provide to you as, as, a, as an aid. So we can pour over it and be paranoid. Yeah, great. Yep. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> and you have a, a bunch of clues to start digging into. Yep. All going to be very exciting. Yep. All right. Here endeth our tale for today. Thank you, thank you anybody who uh, stopped by to see us. Uh, or if you catch us on video, please like, share, and subscribe. We love having new subscribers. And with that, good night.